Okay, so we are going to talk through some renal physiology. So um, part one of urinary system is covering the anatomy, so we have to get through all the structures, and then now we're going to talk about how do those structures all uh, come together to create urine, which is the whole point of having kidneys. So um, just by way of reminder, um, where this process is happening, so all of these aspects of renal physiology are going to be um, located in the nephron, and this is basically the structural and functional um, unit of the kidney. Each kidney, each, each of your little kidneys has got a million nephrons in it, so they're tiny, but they are workhorses. So we're going to talk about how they go through the process of making urine. So they're going to do this through three different processes. So the first one is going to be glomerular filtration. And this is going to result in um, producing filtrate that's going to then go from the glomerulus into the um, renal corpuscle, into the um, Bowman's capsule, and then travel through the rest of the tubular system. Um, now we're going to be able to fine tune that urine a little bit. So we're going to be able to perform what's called tubular reabsorption. And that's when we selectively move substances um, from the filtrate, substances that have initially been um, um, filtered into the tubule, to the renal tubule, and we want to keep it. So we're actually going to move it from the tubule back into our body, back into our um, capillary so that we can hang on to it. So anything for tubular reabsorption is substances that we want to keep. You know, these are things that we want to hold on to. Um, now there are substances that we want to get rid of, and so we call that tubular secretion. And so these are going to be things that we want to um, excrete from our body. So these are going to be like metabolic waste products like urea or uric acid, um, poisons, um, some uh, drugs, that sort of thing. So. These are all going to be things that we want to move from our um, bloodstream into the renal tubule so that it will leave the body as urine. So here's our three different processes. Here's where um, glomerular filtration occurs um, between the glomerulus and um, the um, glomerular capsule. Here's the process of reabsorption, and if you'll look, um, we're moving from tubule back into our capillary because this is um, going to stay within our body. And then here's the process of secretion when we're moving substances um, from the bloodstream into the tubule because we know that anything that is in that tubule is eventually going to make its way out of the body as urine. So just some, just some numbers here, just so you can have an appreciation for like what powerhouses the kidneys are. I mean, they're just amazing. They work through a ridiculous amount of fluid every single day. So if we have our glomerulus, so we've got afferent arterial, here's our tangled mess of capillary bed, that's our glomerulus, and here's our efferent capillary bed moving away from it. So leading into our glomerulus, we've got 1,200 mls of blood every minute. 1200 mls of blood every minute is traveling into the glomerulus, cycling through it, and then some of it is leaving through the efferent um, arterial. Now, of that 1200 per minute, we've got basically being filtered from the glomerulus into the capsule, 120 milliliters per minute is actually going to be filtered. So the grand majority of it actually leaves through the efferent arterial on the other side of it, but 120 mLs per minute actually gets filtered from the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule. Um, and that's what becomes filtrate. So at this point, um, this is called filtrate. This is what's moved into um, the beginning of the tubule. Um, the kidneys process, on the whole, 180 liters of plasma a day. So if you take this 1,200 mLs per minute and calculate it out for the entire day, 
it's about 180 liters. So just think about that for a second. You can, you know, you've got like a two liter thing of soda, um, 180 liters of plasma. It's a ridiculous amount of fluid. Um, but what's even more amazing is that only about 1% of that is secreted from the body as urine. The rest of it, our kidneys process and fine tune, and then we reclaim most of it um, back to the circulatory system. So it's a ridiculous amount of fluid, and most of it we end up keeping, and very little of it um, we secrete from the body, body as urine. Um, so just in terms of clarification, filtrate is not urine. So filtrate, if, if you look, and I keep drawing this, here's my glomerulus, here's my um, afferent and efferent arterioles, here's my Bowman's capsule, and then we're going to go through proximal convoluted tubule, we've got our nephron loop, distal convoluted tubule, and then eventually draining into our collecting duct. So filtrate is what the um, substance is called when it goes from the glomerulus and it's filtered into Bowman's capsule. So this is going to be filtrate right here. And filtrate is basically going to be all the components of blood plasma, of the liquid part of blood, except for the proteins. Because proteins shouldn't be able to make it through the, um, the filtration membrane. And we're going to talk about that. You know, we've got some precautions there, like in terms of um, the filtration membrane being negatively charged, so it repels those proteins, and the pores aren't big enough, the proteins are too big to fit through. We talked about some of those specific characteristic, characteristics of that filtration membrane in the previous lecture. Um, so mostly everything else can um, factor through all the components of blood plasma. So these are not blood cells, those formed elements. That's a whole other category of blood components, right? This is the plasma. This is the liquid part of blood. So all of the liquidy part can go through except for the proteins because they're too big. Um, now, that filtrate makes its way, you know, through the process. And when it's all finished, it is secreted from the body through the um, collecting ducts and out of the body and at this point it is urine okay and so urine is going to basically be fine-tuned filtrate that at this point only contains excess salts and metabolic waste so we're we fine-tuned it to the point where you know we're only getting rid of what we don't need so okay so how do we form urine? The, the process that happens here, we've got three things that happen. First thing is glomerular filtration, and I'm just reminding you of that filtration membrane. Remember, it's got three parts to it. So um, part one is going to be the capillary endothelium, that wall of the capillary. And what type of capillary was that again? Do you remember? So it's a fenestrated capillary, right? So it's got pores in it. And so that's what you can see here. That's going to be this space here and this space here. So remember, it's a fenestrated capillary bed. We've got the basement membrane that's going to connect our two um, parts of the filtration membrane. And then we've got the um, um, visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. And it's going to have the podocytes, which are the specific cells that are located there that have these um, kind of foot processes that extend and they create um, these spaces here called filtration slits that allow for substances to pass through. Now there is this um, diaphragm or this membrane that covers the slit so it doesn't let everything through and that's how these large proteins um, are not able to go from plasma into um, you know the glomerular capsule but other substances can. So we've got, you know, a negatively charged um, membrane here that's going to help to repel them as well. So just, you know, remember what's going on with that filtration membrane. So we do have some pressures that affect filtration. And 
I know that everybody's going to be super excited to see these filtration pressures again. This is going to seem really familiar, and you know all this already because we did it in blood vessels, and it's all the same thing. We're just going to take what you know from blood vessels, and now we're going to apply it to the kidneys. But it's okay. It's all the same thing. So this is just um, things that you already know, and we're just going to apply it to something a little bit new. So we know that pressures come in outward pressures and inward pressures. We saw that with the blood vessels. Um, so let's talk about outward pressures first. So these are going to be outward pressures. And so just to clarify, these are going to be pressures that um, if I draw my glomerulus here, okay, outward pressure is going to be going from, I wonder if I can, oh, I'm going to change my pen color. Hold on, let's do blue. Okay. Um, um, outward pressures are going to be in the direction of promoting filtrate formation. Okay, so they're going to be going from glomerulus into um, Bowman's capsule. Okay, so this is in the direction of um, promoting. Why can't I? There we go. Do that. Um, oh no, it took my drawing away. So promoting filtrate formation. So basically going from, oh no, we can't have that. Okay, glomerulus, and we're going this direction, okay? Going from glomerulus into Bowman's capsule and then starting to go through the tubule, okay? So this is promoting filtrate formation. So we've got a couple pressures here. One of them is going to be the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. So this is the pressure of the blood contained within this capillary bed that's pushing out against the walls of the capillary. It's the same hydrostatic pressure we saw when we did blood vessels. It's the same thing. It's, it's a blood vessel. It's a capillary, just like what we had before. Um, one of the things that we did talk about is that the glomerulus is a little bit unusual because it's got a high pressure. It's a high pressure capillary bed, and that's different. Um, the blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus is about 55 millimeters of mercury, where in a typical capillary bed, it's a lot lower. It's about, it's less than half of that. It's like 25, 26 millimeters of mercury. So that's all for a good reason though, um, and we want that, so it's okay, but the glomerulus um, has a higher hydrostatic pressure to promote this um, formation of filtrate. Now, we have, in theory, colloid osmotic pressure of the capsular space. And so this would be basically, um, if there were proteins in this capsular space, so let's say, in theory, if we had proteins here, those proteins would create an osmotic pressure that's going to like suck the fluid towards them. So again, it would suck the fluid from the glomerulus into the capsular space. Now, I say in theory because if our filtration membrane is working like it's supposed to be, right, there's no proteins here. So no proteins are going to make their way through that filtration membrane as long as everything's working like it's supposed to be. So we shouldn't have this happen. So that's why we say it's basically zero because no proteins travel through the membrane anyway, unless it's damaged. Okay, now the pressures that we have in the opposite direction. So these are going to be pressures um, that oppose urine formation. Okay, so they're going to be basically going in the other direction. So here's my Bowman's capsule. Okay. Um, and so what we have here is two pressures that are going to oppose your information. So one of them is going to be the hydrostatic pressure in the capsular space. So basically, all the filtrate that goes from the glomerulus into the capsular space now creates a pressure in that capsular, capsular space that pushes back onto the glomerulus. Okay? And so this is hydrostatic pressure of that filtrate 
pushing back against the glomerulus capillary bed. Um, the second one is going to be colloid osmotic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. And this is a true pressure. I mean, this is going to play a role because we do have proteins that remain in this glomerular capillary, right? They can't leave because that filtration membrane keeps them from leaving, prevents them from leaving. And so we do have proteins that are here, and those proteins create an osmotic pressure within the glomerular capillary that's also going to suck fluid into um, the glomerulus. And so in this way, because our arrows are opposing filtrate formation, that's what we have there. And we call these inward pressures because they're going back into the glomerulus. So let's put some numbers to it. And this is a nice example. So what we have here, this first one is going to be the hydrostatic pressure of our glomerular, cap, um, glomerular capillary bed. So hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus is higher. It's like 55 millimeters of mercury, which is higher than a typical capillary bed. And so that's going to be um, in the direction of promoting filtrate formation. Now, the other two um, forces, we're going to have hydrostatic pressure of the capsular space, which is basically um, filtrate that has now made its way into the capsule is going to exert pressure back on the glomerulus. Okay, it's going to push back a little bit. And so now we have a hydrostatic pressure in the opposite direction at 15 millimeters of mercury. We also have proteins that are left in that capillary bed, in that glomerulus, and they're creating osmotic pressure. And so they're also um, sucking in or opposing um, filtrate formation with a pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury. So our total pressure going this way is 55. Our total pressure going in okay, um, is going to be 30 plus 15. So we've got 45. Okay, If you had to reconcile these two, they're going in opposite directions, right? So we're going to subtract. So again, you know, kind of like with the blood vessels, don't worry too much about whether you end up with a positive or negative number. You just realize that if these are pressures that are moving in opposite directions, you have to take the difference between the two. If they're moving in the same direction like these two, we can summate them. We add them together because they're both going in the same direction. Here they're going opposite directions. And so we subtract the two of them and we end up with 10 millimeters of mercury. And the direction of this answer here is going to be in the direction of the pressure that's highest. This one is highest. So this pressure is going to be in this direction. It's going to promote um, urine formation or filtrate formation. And we call this our net filtration pressure. Okay, and this is basically, it should all sound really, really familiar because this is exactly what we talked about with blood vessels, okay? Okay, um, and so this is just the same thing. This is basically a, another example. It actually uses um, exactly the same numbers as the previous one, um, but this is showing you here. Here's your net filtration pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury um, of outward pressure um, promoting filtrate formation. Okay, so what do we see here? This net filtration pressure um, can basically end up giving us a glomerular filtration rate. And this is basically how much filtrate is being formed or being pushed from the glomerulus into that capsule every minute. And we see a typical glomerular filtration rate of 120 to 125 mLs per minute. Um, and that's what we see, you know, as kind of a... Um, summation of all of the glomeruli in both of the kidneys um, every single minute. So it's a lot of fluid that our kidneys are processing every single minute. So what affects this glomerular filtration rate? We have three factors that play a role here. 
So net filtration pressure is one, and that's what we just calculated. So net filtration pressure um, leads into glomerular filtration rate, and um, we can basically control the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus by changing the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles. Okay, And this shouldn't really come as a surprise because we know that changing the diameter of blood vessels like um, um, vasoconstriction, vasodilation is a very common way for us to control pressure throughout the body. So the kidney is really no different in that regard. So I do think this is interesting to look at. We can actually tease out some specific things. So for one thing, okay, we have afferent arteriole that's leading into our glomerulus. Efferent arteriole is leading away. How can we change this? One thing we can change is we can dilate that afferent arteriole. So look how much bigger it got. So here compared to here, okay? So if we, if we vasodilate that afferent arteriole, we've got way more blood flowing into that um, glomerulus. What's going to happen to the glomerular hydrostatic pressure? We're going to have increased hydrostatic pressure. If you have increased hydrostatic pressure, it's going to result in increased um, net filtration pressure, and that's going to increase your glomerular filtration rate. So if you've got increased pressure going through it, it's basically like that, um, it's like that soaker hose. So the more water you push into that hose, the more that fluid's gonna um, push out through the little holes. And it's the same thing here. So this is a fenestrated capillary. The more blood you've got going through it, the more blood is gonna leave it. So that's the relationship there. This is kind of interesting because if you drink caffeine, um, caffeine, the reason why caffeine makes you have to use the bathroom is because caffeine vasodilates the afferent arteriole. And if you have increased glomerular filtration rate, you end up having increased urine. Okay, that's basically the end result there. It increases the production of urine. Okay, on the flip side of things, if we had afferent arterial vasoconstriction, so it got smaller, so we have less blood going into that glomerulus, and we combine that with an efferent vasodilation, so more blood is leaving faster, there is a decrease in hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus in this scenario. Basically, it's got less blood going through it. If you have decreased hydrostatic pressure, your net filtra filtration pressure is also going to be decreased. And if you see decreased net filtration pressure, you always see a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Those guys always do the same thing. Okay, so just some ways that we can change that. So that's one factor that affects it. Um, the second factor is going to be um, the, the surface area of the glomerulus. And so basically with this is we've got these cells, these are called mesangial cells, um, that surround the glomerulus, the um, capillary bed. And these mesangial cells can either contract or relax to change the surface area of that glomerulus to allow for increased filtration or decreased filtration. So that's something that is able to change there as well. And then our third factor that affects glomerular filtration rate is the permeability of the filtration membrane. And we know that the um, glomerular capillaries are fenestrated they are very porous. We've got those spaces um, between those endothelial cells within the wall of the capillary. And so it is very porous and allows for substances to pass through. Okay, um, so how we end up controlling um, glomerular filtration rate is basically our body wants to keep um, our glomerular filtration rate within a very narrow range. And it works really hard to do that. So this is an example, obviously, of our body maintaining homeostasis. Our kidneys like a consistent glomerular filtration rate because 
that enables us to um, control the rate at which and the volume of filtrate that we produce. And it also helps us to maintain our blood volume and blood volume has a direct impact on blood pressure. So the relationship that we see here is if we have an increase in glomerular filtration rate, we have more filtrate that's traveling through our renal tubule system and it's gonna result in increased urine leaving the body. If we take, um, if we have increased urine leaving the body, we actually are decreasing our blood volume. So urine and blood volume um, have an inverse relationship, okay? So anything, this is urine volume, anything that increases our urine volume means that we have more fluid leaving the body, we have less fluid in the body, so our blood volume is going to decrease. So these two always have an inverse relationship with each other. Um, if we have decreased blood volume, that means that if we had a cross-section of a blood vessel, the pressure that's being exerted against the walls of that blood vessel is going to be decreased if you have less blood in it. So that's going to result in a decreased hydrostatic pressure within the blood vessels, which basically translates to a decrease in blood pressure. Okay, so that's what happens if we have decreased blood volume. Okay, and this is the whole reason for, you know, if you ever work with patients who have high blood pressure, one of the treatments of choice of them is um, to give them a diuretic which um, promotes urine formation. So their urine, um, oops, their urine, um, volume is going to increase and they're going to pee out more fluid and um, blood volume is going to decrease thereby decreasing blood pressure. Okay, so um, of all of those factors, glomerular hydrostatic pressure is by far the most important variable when we're talking about um, you know, making adjustments to glomerular filtration rate. So when we have increased hydrostatic pressure, um, the net filtration pressure is going to increase. And basically, that's just math. I mean, that makes sense. And you can change the numbers here to see how that's going to affect your um, glomerular filtration um, glomerular filtration rate or your net filtration pressure, too. If we increase our net filtration pressure, then um, we have more forces pushing out this way and our glomerular filtration rate is gonna increase. So maybe instead of that, you know, 120 um, milliliters per minute, maybe we oops, um, are able to, you know, increase that to 140 milliliters per minute, okay? So how do we control glomerular um, hydrostatic pressure? So there's a few different ways we control that. So a few of them are going to be what we call intrinsic controls. And that basically means that um, this is what the kidney does. It's intrinsic to the kidney. So these are going to be um, um, controls that happen through the kidney itself. Okay, intrinsic to the kidney. And that's why we call this autoregulation. So this is the kidney controlling itself. So a couple things that happens here is there's a myogenic mechanism. So myo means muscle. And what we see is if we have our blood pressure increasing too much, the um, smooth muscle, muscle starts to stretch it, within the blood vessels supplying um, the glomerulus. And what's going to happen to protect it because the kidney can be damaged really easily with high blood pressure. That glomerulus is still a capillary bed and it can be damaged if the pressure is too high. Um, so if the kidneys detect too much stretch in terms of increasing blood pressure because of increased blood volume, then the afferent arterioles are going to constrict. And if you look back, let's just 
back up for a second here, when we have afferent arterial vasoconstriction, it ultimately results in decreasing glomerular filtration rate because of this decreased hydrostatic pressure. And that's exactly what we see here. So the afferent arterioles are going to constrict. This is going to result in decreased blood flow into that glomerulus, which is ultimately going to decrease its hydrostatic pressure, and it's going to help protect it from being damaged. Okay, It's a protective mechanism. Okay, We also have what's called the tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. And I know that sounds complicated, but it's not too bad. Um, this is basically a result of the macula densa cells that are part of the juxtaglomerular complex. And we talked about this at the end of the um, urinary system PowerPoint. But this is basically um, macula densa cells are located um, on the, in the walls of the tubule um, at the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And what happens is they monitor sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate. And so what happens with this? I spelled a lot of this out just so you can kind of follow it step by step. But if you have a situation where you have high blood pressure and you have increased glomerular filtration rate, the filtrate is going to travel through the tubule really, really fast. It gets pushed really fast because you've got a lot of fluid traveling through there. If it goes through fast, then there's not enough time for your body to reabsorb the sodium chloride. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the sodium chloride levels in the filtrate remain high, and that stimulates the macula densa cells to react. And what they're going to do is release chemicals that cause vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, which we know from before is going to decrease capillary or glomerular hydrostatic pressure and ultimately reduce net filtration pressure to bring everything back down again. Again, this is protective. We don't want the kidney to be subjected to really, really high blood pressure because especially high blood pressure over an extended period of time is really detrimental. Um, on the other side, um, if you have a low concentration of sodium chloride in the filtrate, that means that the filtrate is traveling really, really slowly. So it's going through the tubule system and it's going so slow that we've got time to pull out all that sodium chloride throughout the whole tubule. Okay, so we have very little sodium chloride that's actually left inside the tubule. So maybe in that case, um, the blood pressure is not high enough, so um, the afferent arteriole is going to vasodilate, which will result in increasing glomerular hydrostatic pressure and thereby increasing that filtration pressure so that we can move that filtrate through a little bit faster. Okay, then if we had intrinsic controls, then you probably suspected that we have extrinsic controls as well. And we do. And what we see with ex extrinsic controls is that these are basically going to be endocrine, kind of a combination of endocrine, oops, sorry, endocrine and um, nervous system interaction to help um, adjust um, glomerular hydrostatic pressure and then in blood pressure as well. So how does this happen? Couple ways. So sympathetic nervous system activation. And we already know this, let's just take it and apply it to the kidneys. So if we have a release of epinephrine and norepinephrine as part of sympathetic nervous system, which we know that's what happens, epinephrine and norepinephrine being released from the adrenal medulla, part of our fight or flight response, they are going to create peripheral vasoconstriction, which we know happens so that we can increase um, resistance and thereby increase blood pressure so we can make sure that um, organs that really need it get adequate blood flow during an emergency. Well, the same thing happens. We have vasoconstriction everywhere throughout the body. Um, 
we also have vasoconstriction of that afferent arterial leading into um, the kidney. So we're going to have um, vasoconstriction of afferent arterial. So we know leading into that capillary bed, it's going to be smaller, so less blood traveling into the glomerulus. That's going to decrease our glomerular filtration rate. Okay, If we have decreased glomerular filtration rate, we have less blood going into the glomerulus, less filtrate going through the tubule. We're going to have a decrease in urine volume. And if we are peeing out less urine, more fluid is being kept inside the body. So our blood volume is going to increase. And increasing blood volume is going to increase blood pressure. Oops. And I know we keep spelling this out, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands this relationship between all of this. Um, so it's going to increase our blood volume and pressure, which is, which is exactly the response that we want when our sympathetic nervous system is being activated, right? We want to have enough blood volume and pressure to be able to adequately provide blood everywhere that we need it. So that's what we see there. Um, the second mechanism is going to be um, a hormonal one, and this is our renin, angiotensin, aldosterone kind of cascade. So what we see with this is um, the stimulus is low blood pressure. This causes granular cells, which um, if you look back at the juxtaglomerular um, um, ju sorry, I thought I had a picture of it, juxtaglomerular um, complex or apparatus um, those granular cells are located within the um, afferent arterial. So low pressure um, is going to stimulate those mechanoreceptors to stimulate the granular cells to release renin, um, which is an enzyme that causes angiotensinogen, which is a protein in its kind of non-active form, to convert to angiotensin 1. And then we have angio, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is ACE, um, responsible for converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. This is kind of like a cascade of, of happenings. Um, angiotensin 2 now is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex, which we know is one of the endocrine glands, right? And we had talked before about cortisol. Well, this is a different type of hormone that's secreted by the adrenal cortex, and it secretes aldosterone. And aldosterone is a hormone that um, causes the kidneys to reabsorb more sodium. And so basically what happens is through our um, tubular system, what's going to happen is we are going to move sodium from the tubule into the um, peritubular capillaries. Okay, so here's maybe our little peritubular capillary, and sodium is going to move into that peritubular capillary. Well, what happens between water and salt? Water follows salt, right? So water is then going to follow and as a result, um, we're going to absorb more water into the capillaries, which is going to result in an increase in blood volume and a resulting increase in blood pressure as well. Um, so this is kind of our reaction to low blood pressure. And, you know, this is, this is all how the kidneys play a vital role in maintaining our blood pressure within that norm normal homeostatic range. So this is all what happens with low blood pressure. Obviously, if you flipped everything around, that would be the reaction to um, high blood pressure. But this is what you see there. Okay, this is just an overview of everything that we just talked about. I just put it in um, kind of more of a visual format there.